Hello everyone, welcome to the D8 Education Podcast, your program to be updated on the digital heritage education domain. I'm your host, Raul Gomez Hernandez, and I'm glad to be here with you. In this third episode, we will talk with Lotte Belize Baltusen about the relationship between cultural heritage institutions, providers and schools related to the digital heritage education, how young people face digital heritage education environments, which new pedagogies are used in digital heritage education and how they can improve it for boosting creativity, motivation, participation and engagement with arts, culture and heritage in young learners. Stay to the end and discover some innovative projects and book recommendations to explore more around this topic. Young people aged between 12 and 30 years old in Europe are really diverse. They have different habits, different origins, but they have some patterns in common. According to Eurostat, less than one-third of the U27 population was under the age of 30. As of 1st January 2019, representing 17% of this total population, the young people aged between 15 and 29 years old. Half of this population, according to the OECD statistics, has parents with different origins. It shows the diversity of Europe at this age. In the technological aspect, conforming to the findings of the Net Children Go mobile project, the U27 teens have their first smartphone at 9 years old. And according to Eurostat, 94% of young people make a daily use of smartphones for social activities and networking. From the cultural perspective, the cultural habits are now turning digital. Booking a ticket, watching a movie, or playing games are mostly activities made online. According to Eurostat, in the case of cultural heritage, only 47% of young people in the last year visited a museum or made any other activity related to cultural heritage. The main reason was not to have any interest in it, followed by not having enough income from young adults. Now, let me propose some questions. Is this reason motivated by the lack of heritage education in schools? Do the teachers have enough training? This week, I would like to talk with Lotte Belize Baltusen about it. Hello Lotte, thank you very much for being here in this third episode. Hi Raul, thanks for having me. Let me introduce yourself a bit to the audience. Lotte Belize Baltusen studied media and culture at the University of Amsterdam and specialized further in the field of audiovisual heritage during the Master Preservation Presentation of the Moving Image. From 2009 to 2015, she worked for the Netherlands Institute for Sound Ambition at the Research and Development Department. After that, she started as a freelance digital project manager in the heritage sector. Among other things, she was the program manager digital strategy at the Amfram House in Amsterdam. She currently works for the program Unlocking Digital Heritage for Education, a collaboration between Kennisnet, the public organization for education and city, in the Netherlands and the Dutch Digital Heritage Network. The aim of the program is to research how retable and usable digital heritage is and how it can be meaningfully used in education, or more specifically, how to best incorporate cultural heritage in primary and secondary education classrooms through the use of ICT. As many studies reveal, to be considered a digital native do not apply to be a digital literate. The same relationship can be applied for teachers and cultural heritage. Teachers are interested in using digital cultural heritage, but they haven't trained on it. From your experience working in digital cultural heritage education projects, how do you see the relationship between cultural heritage institutions, providers and schools? Are there enough ready-to-use materials for educational purposes? Are the institutions taking into account teacher needs and student interests when they curate these materials? Yeah, so there's a couple of parts to this question and I will go through them one by one. Uh, do keep in mind that this is from the perspective of the Dutch education system and my experiences in the Dutch heritage sector, but I have talked with a lot of international uh, researchers and educators and heritage professionals and they do confirm these general findings. So that's maybe good to know to frame the research that we've been doing. Um, so first of all, there is a lot of offerings from cultural heritage institutions for schools. So there's loads of it, um, but a lot of it is not really fit for purpose for teachers. So 
they are made from the perspective, these digital lessons, for instance, or uh, physical visit workshops from the perspective of the cultural heritage organizations. So what they want to tell, but that doesn't necessarily mean that is um, useful uh, for teachers because maybe it is not exactly the topic that they teach. Also, um, a lot of teachers are really pressed for time. I'm sure everyone knows this. And when you offer a full digital lesson or even a series of lessons, like do these six lessons about this topic, then teachers will not be able to because it just simply doesn't fit their schedule. Um, also, because a lot of um, organizations uh, are very text heavy and like to explain and tell a lot, that makes students bored after like 10 minutes uh, uh, working with the material. So those are some, some issues. Um, so what would work if cultural heritage organizations would look into the curriculum in, in their countries a little bit more, like what is being taught in primary education and secondary education, and then make sure that they identify the most important topics and work with those. Um, another really useful change for uh, many of these digital offerings is to make more modular working forms. So what I mean is like, tell a teacher, like if you do this assignment, it will only take 15 minutes uh, of your class and then they're more likely to use it very often. And um, also make these lessons or working forms more interactive and hands-on. So if you give students themselves the power to do research or to create something, they will be much more engaged. So these are some of the issues, but also some of the solutions that we found within our program. That's a really interesting reflection, Lotte, about the way people are working nowadays in the heritage education sector, and how teachers and students are involved in this situation. I agree with you that all stakeholders should cooperate in creating the educational materials together. One of the aims of this project is to promote cooperation in the field. As part of the Unlocking Digital Heritage for Education project, you have been researching how schools use those materials with teachers' interviews and observing the implementation of cultural heritage content with ICT in some late primary and secondary classrooms. So, I would like to know, according to the teachers, what's the attitude of young learners toward the use of digital cultural heritage in the classrooms? Oh, that's a great question. Well, when people hear the word heritage, they often think of like boring old stuff. Uh, and I mean that not as a knock because I love heritage. It is the field that I work in, but of course I'm a little bit biased because I love it. Um, so it's not a word that inspires people immediately often. And people also think more about buildings like monuments, you know, in the streets or like old windmills when they think about heritage. So if you ask a teacher, oh, do you want to use heritage? It's sometimes hard to see why this would be interesting or, or relevant. Um, that being said, imagine what a student might think if they hear the word heritage. Um, on the other hand, what is very interesting, heritage in the Netherlands is actually quite a big part of the curriculum. Um, and a lot of schools also plan physical visits, um, for instance, to museums or local monuments, um, or they take workshops and classes on more intangible heritage, like dialects, for instance, that's, that's a really big topic, or food, uh, which is often combined with windmill visits, like how is flour made in a windmill and then make pancakes? Uh, you know, that's, that's actually something that happens. Um, but that's the physical part, right? So the digital part, that's even harder to sell in a way because what is being offered is quite fragmented. So there's, of course, many heritage institutions and very many types uh, from local to regional to national and it's museums and archives and libraries and all kinds of organizations. So it can be quite hard to find for teachers. And when they do find it, like I said, in uh, after your first question, it's sometimes hard to quickly see how is this useful and relevant for me. So what we found is that cultural heritage organizations can do something about this. There are a lot of existing platforms that teachers already use. Uh, in the Netherlands, we have something called Wikivise or Lesson Up, which are platforms where teachers actually go to find uh, all kinds of materials and anyone can add to them. 
Um, and also make clear how much time does it take you to actually prepare and give a lesson or work from. And also what the learning goals are. Um, and it also helps you as a cultural heritage organizations if you define like, okay, this is what the student will be able to know and do after they go through this lesson materials, then uh, teachers are much more likely to use it. And also it sharpens your mind if you have to define these learning goals. Um, and related to that, I said it also before, the teaching methods. They, they're the primary uh, source for teaching. So why not look into them and see how you can add to it or even replace some stuff. And finally, use terms that are used by teachers and students. So that sounds very abstract. So to give an example, um, for instance, citizenship is a really big topic uh, in the curriculum in the Netherlands. And on the other hand, there are not a lot of really great um, teaching methods that incorporate it because it's quite a new topic in a way. So if you make sure you use that kind of word that is used a lot by teachers and students that they recognize from the curriculum, then they're, they makes it easy to find you uh, on the internet. Yeah, it's a great question. If teachers are not familiarized enough with cultural heritage, young learners can be either. Any strategies you propose to bring close cultural heritage to the teachers or use a closer language or a topic they know very well for students is welcome. I think it's a really useful approach. Exactly. Well, we have talked about teachers and students toward digital cultural heritage materials. Let's speak now about educational strategies in the classroom. According to your experience with teachers, could you tell educators listening to this podcast how they can improve their user experience for boosting creativity, motivation, participation, and engagement with cultural heritage in young learners? Yes, that is the million dollar question indeed. Um, so I've done research on it, but like you said, I've also been to classrooms and observed um, teachers working with uh, cultural heritage. And the reason I've been able to do so is because from our program, uh, we are also supporting various projects that have the aim of unlocking digital heritage to classrooms. So I've been very lucky before the Corona crisis uh, happened to visit a lot of schools. So this is based both on research and what I've seen. First of all, create more interaction and more learning by doing. So for instance, we support a project by uh, Naturales, which is a Dutch natural history museum uh, called Natuurlab. And this is an online research environments in which students can do their own biology research. Because it is more interactive and because they have to go into nature themselves, take a picture of what they found and then describe it in this learning environment, they are much more engaged and, and much more interested in the topic. And also they learn a lot more. So less talking, more interaction. Secondly, more visuals, less texts. So like I said, a lot of offerings from cultural heritage organizations for education are very heavily text-based and that is just quite difficult to digest. So if you use more images or short videos combined with text, so these combinations and varying usage of media, that works really, really well. Thirdly, I said it before, use more shorter modular working forms. So short assignments of 10, 15 minutes that um, students and teachers can include in the lesson in a more flexible way. It doesn't mean you have to let go of your approach of creating a 16 minute lesson or a 60 minute visit, but for teachers that are more pressed for time, that is actually really very useful. So an example of this is the uh, program called the Digital Block Calendar, and specifically on the topic of citizenship by uh, Erfgoedhuis South Holland and uh, Kunstgebouw in the south of the Netherlands. They created working forms about topics around citizenship that are super low thresholds. You can do them in 15 minutes. They're very visual. They contain either a picture of an artwork, a picture of uh, digital heritage or a document, and they have really interesting questions that students can debate about, for instance, in the class. And of course, you can take 60 minutes to do a whole part of that block calendar, or you can just pick one. And that works really well. I've seen students super engaged and 
having great discussions with each other. Um, another way to engage students is to link to current and recurring events. So uh, I found that a lot of teachers are always looking for uh, topics that are in the news or that are recurring events. So what do I mean with that? For instance, in Holland, you have the Children's Book Week in September, October, uh, which, in which uh, children are stimulated to read. And they're always looking for cool lesson materials around topics like this, always around that time. So if you're a cultural heritage organization, what better way to facilitate these teachers to have like nice working forms related to the topic that you put on the forefront around that time. So that works really well. Um, also connecting the then to the now. So a great example of this is Expedition Freedom. It's a project that we support by the historical center Overijssel, which is a province in the Netherlands. So it is about World War II and um, a topic always part of the curriculum, but it's also connected to the now. So the, these citizenship themes like discrimination and exclusion and prejudice are something that were happening during World War II, obviously, but that also are still happening now. So if you make it relevant to the world of the students that they live in now, then they're much more likely to be engaged and pay attention and to do things. Um, and that also goes for these links to their surroundings. So that's also something that Expedition Freedom does. It's called place-based education, which basically means if you use materials uh, from the environment that students live in, that they bike through every day, like an old World War II bunker picture, for instance, they're like, hey, I know this. And then they're much more likely to sit up straight and pay attention and to really love this topic. I've seen it happen. It's, it's really, really powerful. So that's a, a great thing for more local and regional uh, organizations because they have a lot of this uh, in their collections usually. And finally, be wary of what students know and are able to do in various stages of development and our educational level. Um, so in primary school, um, students are not really equipped yet to have intricate debates. Uh, so if you want to do a debate program, you have to ask very much more simple questions than if you would do this with students that are already 16 years old. I mean, it sounds very logical, but it's good to reflect critically on what students know and are able to do and just to connect with what they find interesting. So a great example of that, again, is the digital block calendar citizenship uh, in which sustainability is a topic. Well, like heritage, it's not a topic that makes your heart maybe beat faster if you don't know a lot about it. So what they did is um, link it to the uh, concept and topic of fashion. So fast fashion, if you buy something at you know, you run over the mill uh, clothing store um, and it's only five euros. What is, is that sustainable? How, how is that possible? So then you link this topic to something very concrete that the students know and recognize. And that is a topic that they find interesting. So these are about seven tips that I can give from the top of my head. Oh, great. Those are really good examples of how to implement some techniques for doing it easily. It's really nice to see how some projects are working on giving recommendations to educators for building new materials for implementing projects together. Those are really good examples from the Netherlands and citizenship is the perfect topic to relate it to the values of cultural heritage and improve society too. Yes, definitely. To end this talk, could you give one more tip or one more recommendation to our audience about the way they can access digital cultural heritage educational materials for the classroom. I don't know if you work on a repository or a website where CHS staff and educators can find these cultural heritage educational materials or good practices in the field you spoke on the recommendations. Could you tell us more about it? So a lot of what we've written as output of our project is obviously in, in Dutch, but we are going to translate some of our findings into English as well. So there is a report that we made in the first phases of uh, our program, and it's called How Available and Usable is Digital Heritage for Education. And it kind of contains a lot of the things I reflected on today. So I think that's a really great resource to start. And hopefully in a few months, we'll have a little bit more about uh, what I talked about. Um, 
but also one report that I found super useful. It's by the um, UK organization called GEM, and they have a great collection of case studies on remote learning in uh, museums, heritage, and cultural settings, which also um, has uh, documented a lot of experience about teaching virtual uh, classes by museum edu educators or heritage educators. And I, I find those super inspiring and I think everyone can take a lot of inspiration from that. So those are two that I think are very useful for the listeners of this podcast. Now, I remember a project from the University of Graz, Austria, called Museum Digital Initiatives during the coronavirus pandemic. In this project, the researcher created an interactive map with all initiatives, including a great part of educational content, games, and educational activities produced during this time. I think Nemo and Europeana highlighted on their website. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk with you and know more about the perception of digital cultural heritage in schools. Thank you very much for having me and for giving me a platform to share what we've learned. If you would like to learn more about educational practices with cultural heritage and digital tools, I recommend you this week a handbook from the Publication Office of the European Union titled Europe's Cultural Heritage Toolkit for Teachers edited in 2018 for the European Year of Cultural Heritage. This toolkit includes teacher worships, tips, activity plans for the classroom and project proposals. Take a look on the Digital Heritage Education blog and see how easy it is to introduce cultural heritage in your educational plans, combining traditional materials and ICT. To take an approach around how to create educational content for young audiences in the heritage context, the guide published by the Heritage Fund, titled Working with Children and Young People Online, produced by Children International for the National Lottery Heritage Fund in 2020, is a really good document to know some guidelines. If you want to know European projects working on digital cultural heritage with young people, I suggest you visit the Crowd Dreaming Project. It aims to disseminate toward co-creating with digital cultural heritage as a good practice for inclusive education and promotion of European values among young people. Another powerful project is the Heritage Hub project. This project aims to enhance intercultural interaction by encouraging young people to explore and share their own heritage and to get to know and practice the heritage of the others. They publish a manual for cultural heritage education user read with some recommendation of physical practices, but also digital activities to engage with young learners. At this moment, some of the physical practices can be transformed into digital and many examples of that you can find online. Thank you very much for being today with Lotte Belize Baltusen and me in this podcast. Next week, a new expert will come and a new topic will be. Find all the resources from the topics we talk about in this podcast on the resource section of the TH Education blog. If you like this podcast, subscribe to the YouTube channel, share with your colleagues, follow the podcast on Spotify, iBox, or any platform you listen to, and follow the project on social media. See you next week.